seat, and as you're doing so, take your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, we've got Bibles under some of the seats, so feel free to grab one of those, uh, and you can look there. Now, if you're using one of our Bibles that are under the chairs, um, you can turn to page 920. I'll give you the cheater. Uh, If you are using your own Bible or whatever, then you may want to go to the table of context context, because Jonah is literally four chapters and it's like two to three pages in in any given Bible. So it's kind of hard to find at times, especially if you're kind of flipping through the pages. So uh, don't be afraid to do that. Now, as you're turning to Jonah chapter two, uh, let me give you uh, what we talked about last week. Let me tell you what happens in Jonah chapter one. Okay, so Jonah chapter one begins with this prophet named Jonah, and God comes to Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach to the Ninevites. And Jonah, mind you, he's a prophet. Jonah decides that he's not going to go to Nineveh. He's going to get on a boat and go the opposite direction, as if he can run from God. So he gets on a boat. He decides he's going to run from God. And when he's on the boat... God sends this massive hurricane-style storm to sink the boat, to, to get Jonah to realize what he's done. And so the boat's getting ready to sink. The sailors are trying to figure out what to do. And so they start decide they need to figure out whose God is mad at who on the boat. And so they do what's casting lots. It was a way to figure out what was going on and to decide who was in the wrong. They cast lots. And they figure out that it's Jonah. And they go to Jonah and say, who are you? Where are you from? What God do you serve? And what have you done? And Jonah says, well, I'm a Hebrew. I I serve Yahweh God, the the God of the Israelites, the one true God. And and yeah, I'm running away from him. And the the sailors are like, you're an idiot. Stop. And so they they tell him, we're going to try and figure things out. They throw things off the boat to try and save it. They can't do it. The storm's too great. And so they finally say, Jonah, we're sorry. And they pick him up and throw him off the boat. Literally pick him up and throw him off. As soon as they throw him off, everything's fine. And on a side note, those sailors end up sacrificing and worshiping God after experiencing what God did in that moment. But Jonah gets thrown into the water, and Jonah chapter 1 ends with verse 17, which says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay? If, if you were to ask the typical child who went to like vacation Bible school or church camp or something like that, what's the memorable part of Jonah? They would tell you that Jonah gets swallowed by a big fish, right? This is the part of the story that we all remember. So, Let's pick up, though, in chapter 2, because there's so much more to Jonah than a fish. So let's read chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1, and it says this. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Now keep in mind, he's in a fish. Okay, you with me? He's in the stomach of a fish. All right, so, verse 2, saying... I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounding me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. All right, stop there for just a second. Verses 1 through 3 of Jonah chapter 2 is basically Jonah realizing that he's messed up. And he is now receiving some pretty severe punishment for his mess up. So let's pick up in verse 4. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope in steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, 
will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So verses 4 through 9 is Jonah realizing just how much trouble he's put himself in. And he praises God in it. He realizes, I brought this on myself. I'm the one who messed up, and I deserve the punishment that I received. But despite that punishment, despite the hard circumstances, I'm going to praise God anyway. And then it ends with verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. All right, so let's stop and think about this for a second, because I think we kind of gloss over a lot of Bible stuff that we really need to think about for a moment. We have a beautiful lake just to, you know, right outside our doors right here. And many of you love to be out on that lake to fish. Many of you take your kids and your grandkids out to the lake to swim and play uh, and uh, have recreation out there. But how many of you have been out at the lake basking in the sun on the beach and a massive fish swims up and and spits out a man. I don't see any hands because it doesn't happen. And not only that, think about this. This is a man who's been in a fish not for like a minute. He's been in the belly of the fish for three whole days. Have you smelled a fish before? You think the outside of a fish smells bad. What do you think the inside of the fish smells like? That's what Jonah smelled like. He's been thrown up onto the shore after being in a fish for three days and three nights. And the people on the shore are not seeing this, witnessing this man thrown up on stage. They're not looking at that going, oh, what a beautiful thing God did. That's not the response. People probably ran screaming in terror because this kind of thing doesn't happen. To be honest, if you think about it, and we're going to look at this in just a minute, but if you read chapter 2 in depth, Jonah is saying that his death was in drowning. If you read this in depth, he talks about how he went to the deep and the flood overtook him and there was weed, seaweed surrounding and wrapping around his head. Guys, The fish was the salvation, not the punishment. How bad is that? That his his punishment was that he thought he was going to die through drowning. That That the water was surrounding him. And his salvation is that God brought a fish to him who swallowed him for three days. I don't know about you, but if I'd been in a fish for three days and I got spit out on shore, that sunlight would have been salvation for me. And so wrap your mind around that for just a second because I think, again, we sugarcoat this all too often. Jonah was at the brink of drowning. He was at the bottom of the ocean getting ready to be dead. And God sent a fish to save him. God didn't send a life preserver or give him the sudden energy to be able to swim to the top of the water. God sent a fish to save Jonah. So here's what I want to talk about today. Today I want to talk about getting right with God. Because let's be honest, we all rebel from God from time to time, don't we? We all stray from God. We all do things that separate us from God and his presence. And so today I want to talk about when we're living in that rebellion, when we feel separated from God, how do we come back to him? How do we get right with God? And I think Jonah gives us three steps. Jonah gives us three steps of what it looks like to get right with God again. And those three steps, the first two, are things that we do. And then the last step is God's response to what we do. to to the way we respond. So let's look at these three steps because I'm going to say this. It's not complicated. I think that we as Christians have a tendency to overcomplicate very simple spiritual matters. This is not a complicated thing, but I'm also not going to tell you it's an easy thing. Uh, These first two steps can be difficult. 
These first two steps can be hard steps to take. So let's look at them so that we can begin the process of understanding what it looks like to get right with God. So the first step is that we have to realize. Step one is that we have to realize. We have to realize how we're rebelling from God, how we're living outside of God's plan for our life, okay? You know, Jonah realized, didn't he? Jonah had an aha moment. Now, it took getting thrown off of a boat overboard and almost drowning and getting swallowed by a fish before Jonah had his aha moment. Don't be Jonah, by the way. But Jonah had one of these aha moments. Now, I'll tell you right now, I've had a big fish moment. I've had one of these moments where I kind of hit rock bottom. And don't raise your hand, but how many of you, how many of us in this room have had a big fish moment where we've hit rock bottom and God was the only thing that could get us out? I think a lot of us in here could say that. And if you haven't, you are smart. Keep up that pattern. Don't have a Jonah moment. You don't have to hit rock bottom. But my big fish moment was when I was in college, I made stupid, horrible, dumb financial decisions. And I got in a lot of trouble financially. And I had multiple opportunities to take my situation and correct it and make it better and follow God more closely with the way that I used and managed my money. But I never took advantage of it. My hit rock bottom moment, my big fish moment, was when a police officer was putting cuffs on my hands and putting me in the back of a car. That was my big fish moment. I had gotten in so much trouble financially that I had warrants for my arrest, and I got arrested because I decided that I knew better how to manage my money than God did. And as a result, I got put in the belly of something. I got put in the belly of a jail cell. Now, it was in that moment, though, that things began to change. Because did that alter the way I was looking at my situation? <laughs> Absolutely it did. That changed the way I perceived how I had been handling my rebellion, my disobedience to God's direction in my life. And so that was my aha moment. That was the point when I realized I can't keep doing what I'm doing. That was the moment when I realized I've got to change something because what I'm doing is not going to correct this. Now my encouragement to you is don't be like me. Don't be like Jonah. Don't wait for that rock bottom, horrible, desperate moment. See what God's doing. Realize what God is leading you to do, what decisions he's calling you to make before you hit the rock bottom. Because the rock bottom's not any fun. Which leads me into the second step. So the first step is we have to realize how we're living in rebellion to God. The second step is that we need to repent. We need to repent. And that's what Jonah does in verses 4 through 9. He begins the process of repenting and praising God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't throw around the word repent and repentance in everyday language all that often. Do you? Probably not. It's kind of a churchy word. It's kind of one of those words we use in this context right here, but we don't use it in everyday language all that often. So what does it mean to repent? What is repentance? Well, it's very simple. The, if you go and read the Bible in the original languages that it was written in, Hebrew and Greek, the word literally means to turn around. The, the idea was is that you realize you're going the wrong direction and you stop, you turn around and start going the correct direction. That was the concept here. So spiritually, we're talking about realizing the rebellion that you're going through, that you're driving along spiritually, and say, I'm not going to do this anymore, and you take the steps to correct course, to get in line with God. So it's an act of repent. It's an act of like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's regretting. It's regretting and being sorry for what you've done, but it's also taking the steps to not do those things or live that way anymore. It's not enough. It wouldn't have been enough for me sitting in the jail cell to go, oh, this is no fun. 
and not do anything about it. Because if I would have gotten out of jail in that moment and not made any changes to my life, where would I have been six months down the road? Back in a jail cell. Because repentance is not just regret. Repentance is regret that's followed by action. It's not enough for us to say, oh man, I'm sorry. Oh, I really regret that decision that I made or I really regret those words that I use. It's not enough to just say we're sorry. We have to take action to correct whatever it was that we did or said. You know, what's the old saying? A real sign of really being sorry is the action you take to show that you're going to not do that again, right? So the idea here is that repentance is the regret and the action that follows. So I realized when I was in jail that I was the one who made the stupid mistakes that had put me there. I'm the one who was dumb. I'm the one who rebelled against the wisdom of God that I knew was right. And in that moment, I made decisions to not do that anymore. I repented. I made financial decisions in that moment because I realized I was going out to eat four to five times a week. And yet I owed thousands of dollars to people and was in trouble with the law because of that. I was going to the movie three or four times a month and dropping 50 bucks to get a movie ticket and snacks because you can't go to the movie for cheap, let's be honest. I was... I had one of the highest tiers in a cable package that you could get because I wanted to live in comfort. I wanted my luxuries. But when I was sitting in that jail cell, did I have any of those luxuries? No. I didn't have the option to go to the movies, and I didn't have the option to go out to eat, and I didn't have the option to, you know, use my cable and internet package. The idea was, is I realized in that moment that I needed to make some corrections to the way that I was living my life. That's repentance. Realizing what you need to do to change your circumstances. So in that moment, I repented and I began making changes. But I also got something in that moment. The Bible describes in the Old Testament that when we sin, we separate ourselves from God. It's us doing that. It's not God walking away from us. It is when we sin, we consciously take a step back away from God and we separate ourselves from that relationship. But the Bible also says in James chapter 4 verse 8 that when we come closer to God, He comes closer to us. So in that moment, when I realized how I was living in rebellion and I began living in repentance... God's presence became much more real in my life. And that's a big deal because God's presence provides power. God's presence can provide power to your situation. It provided power in my situation. When I began to repent and I began experiencing once again the power of the presence of God, I suddenly had the ability to endure that difficult situation. Look at Jonah. He was in a difficult situation. Can we all agree? Absolutely. Belly of a fish. Doesn't get much worse than that. So he's in the belly of the fish, but the moment he began repenting and praising God, he had the power to endure that situation. So God's power gives us the endurance that we need to face the difficulties of our life. But God also answers us and delivers us from impossible situations. It was through Jonah's repentance that God responded and saved him, isn't it? If Jonah had remained in that fish and gone, this is not my fault, you shouldn't have ever sent me over there. If he would have continued rebelling from God, do you think God would have ever saved him? No. Why would God do that? It's through his power, through his presence, that we can endure and get through impossible situations. Living in a fish is an impossible situation. I'll tell you right now, the moment I got arrested felt like an impossible situation. It felt like everything in my life had just fallen apart. That that there was no hope, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. But his presence 
suddenly gave me the hope that I needed. Which leads us into step three. So we talked about realize your rebellion. The second step was repent. And the third step is what God does in response, and that's redemption. Redemption. God brings redemption when we begin to follow him more closely. I have a five-month-old son at home. He turns five months old tomorrow. His name's Declan. He's the cutest child on the face of the planet, and none of you can argue otherwise. Shut your mouths. (laughs) But parents or anybody who's been around an infant, when that infant starts crying, do you pick that infant up and take it outside and then go back inside so you don't have to listen to it anymore? No. When your baby cries, when Declan begins to cry, whatever I'm doing stops and I go to Declan. That's my response. Because quite frankly, it's not because he's annoying me. It's not because the cry is something that irritates me. I go to my son because I love him. I go to my son because I want to take the crying and change it to contentment. I want to take my son's discomfort and fix it, right? Isn't that what we do as parents? Okay, you're crying, you're hungry, let me feed you. Okay, you're crying, you've got a dirty diaper, let me change that. Okay, you're lonely and you just want to be held, let me hold you. Now, when we cry out to God, God answers. That's what redemption is. When we cry out to him, he answers. And let's be honest, While I respond to my son with a huge amount of love, my love is nothing compared to the love of God. And so when we cry out, God steps in and answers in the perfect way, in his perfect love, doesn't he? That's what redemption is. It's us crying out in our difficulty, in our pain, in whatever circumstance we're in, and it's God saying, let me step in and fix this for you. Let me take the mess you've made or the hurt you feel and turn it into something beautiful. That's love. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to respond out of his perfect love for us. And that's the whole point of redemption and love is to, it's to give us the freedom to live in him so that we can follow him more closely. Listen to what John 8, 31 through 36 has to say about this. John 8, 31 through 36, it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Listen how the Israelites answered him. They answered him and said, We are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. Okay, put that in modern terms. We look at God and go, what do I need to be set free from? I'm an American. I've never been enslaved by anyone, right? We say that to God subconsciously, sometimes consciously. But listen to what they say. How is it you say you will be free? Verse 34, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. You see, redemption is about accepting the love and the forgiveness and the authority that God has in our lives and living in the freedom that that brings to us. And isn't that what Jesus did for us at The onset, isn't that what Jesus did from the very start? Think about it. Son of God, living in a perfect existence in heaven. He comes to this earth, lives here for 33 years, lives a perfect, sinless life. And yet, despite his perfection, despite who he is, he's nailed to a cross, condemned to die. And in that moment hanging on the cross, he became the perfect sacrifice for your and my sins. 
in that moment, he wiped away the mistakes, the sins, the rebellion that we live in continuously. He wiped that away and cleansed us of it. That's what his death on the cross did for us. Then on the third day, he conquered death. He had victory by raising from the grave. And then he ascended into heaven. And if you're sitting here today, and you are not a follower of Christ, but you hear that and you say, you know, that's something that I think I would like to have in my life, then it's very simple. Here in a few minutes, we're going to close the service out, and we'll have our prayer team up here at the front. And all you have to do is come up here in the midst of everybody already up walking around. No one's going to single you out. Come up here and talk to one of our prayer team members and Ask them, what does this look like? What does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to begin a life-changing relationship with Jesus? And they would love to walk you through that and explain what that is and what it means. But for those who know Christ, who already have a life-changing relationship with Him, living in that redemption means that we've got to look in the mirror and realize how we're not following Him. And then we have to repent. We have to see what we're doing wrong and turn away from it and then live in the beautiful redemption that God has for us. Because that's what God does. His redemption then should inspire us to go and open that redemption up to others. So let me give you a little preview of what happens in the next chapter. Don't tell Chad because he's preaching on this next week. But next week, chapter 3 Jonah, covered in fish, whatever, on the shore, hears God tell him, now go to Nineveh. And Jonah says, okay. And he goes to Nineveh, and because he preaches a message message of redemption, lives are changed. That rock bottom moment, that big fish moment in our lives, and God's redemption out of that, should inspire us to show that redemption to everyone around us. Now, that doesn't mean you carry Bible tracts in your pocket and you're talking to every stranger that you come in contact with. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about those people that you encounter day in and day out that are looking for something, that need some redemption in their life, that need some love and freedom in their life. That's going to them and saying, hey, why don't you come to church with me next Sunday? I'll come pick you up at 9, we'll go to church. By 9 or 10.30, we'll be going and eating brunch. Let me do that for you. It's inviting someone to hear the message of redemption that God has for them. So who is it that needs to hear that message of life change? Who is it that needs to hear an invite to church from you? And then, what is it in your life that you need to step back and realize that you're living in rebellion through? And what is it that you need to start changing in your life? Will you join me in prayer?